Lord Jesus, we just thank you, God, because we know that your presence is here with us, Jesus, that you're going to guide us and lead us into your presence, God, and we just, we just long to be in your presence this morning, God, and we just thank you for each and every person that's here, and I just pray that you would remain with us throughout the service. In Jesus' name, amen.
fighting for us. Amen. Definitely do not miss the story every day. It has just been so good. And I screenshot it. So honestly, I can't remember if this is from the story of the day or my devotion. Either way, it's from the Bible app. <laughs> so this is what I, um, I wanted to share with y'all. What is worship? First, let's take a moment to acknowledge that worship is more than singing songs. 
Singing songs is one of the spiritual disciplines that helps us worship God, but that's not all that worship is. So what is worship? Worship is putting God first. Or if we want to take a step back, we can define worship as the act of putting something first. So y'all just for a minute think of the thing, the person maybe that is first in your life right now. And, you know, you're going to spend your time, your energy, and your attention on that person or that thing. But that person should be God. Amen. For most of us, there will be times when the thing we worship is not God. And that's a problem because especially if we're Christians, worship has profound effects on how we live and how we treat other people. The spiritual discipline of worship is the act of choosing, choosing to put God first. It's a discipline because it's not always easy, but it is always worth it. Why? Because when we put God first, when we choose to worship him, it changes everything. Worship does two things. Number one, it proves our priorities. When we choose to worship God, we are making the right answer to what we value most. Number two, worship unifies us with God and with others. When we put God first, we start to see ourselves, others, and the world the way God sees us. And when we start to see the way God sees, we start to love the way God loves. I love that. I love that. I just thought that was so good. And I just, I just wanted to share that with y'all this morning. So with that in mind, let's worship with this song, The Goodness of God. <laughs>
faithful. You've always been there and always will be for us. God, help us to see that you are always running, always pursuing us. Thank you, Jesus, for that goodness. In Jesus' name, thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How many of you have been good this week? Got a little bit of feedback. I'll say that again. How many of y'all have been good this week? Well, that would be me. I got a bad feedback up here. You can turn the... Uh, Probably the stage, mix one and two, turn it, mute it, please. Um, my point is this, we may not have been good, but God is always good, amen? And whatever our shortfallings are, or were, or will be, uh, it doesn't affect the fact that God is good. Amen. I think you got it that time. Thank you, bro. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hope everybody has had a good week, though, even though you may not have been good. Hope your week was good. Good to see everybody here this morning. If you're joining us by way of live stream, it's good to have you joining us this way. And so good, good to have everybody, whether you're here in person or joining us electronically, good to have you here. We worship the Lord this morning. Appreciate our worship team as they lead us, as they've done this morning. Praise God for them. Amen. We have lots of things to bring before the Lord in prayer. Um, we lost uh, another great saint of God this week, Miss uh, Delray Dewberry, Mama's older sister, 94, passed away and uh, laid her to rest this week, this past Friday. Um, what a great lady of God. Man, I tell you what, that lady knew that she could praise the Lord, knew that she could pray. And if she or, or many of those other Godwin sisters, uh, you knew if you needed to get in touch with the Lord, you can get in touch with one of them, and they can figure out some way uh, to get in touch with God for you. Amen? And uh, we all have the access to the Father. But there are certain people, you know, that we come in contact with. We know that, man, they've been in the presence of God. And it's a blessing for us to be able to go to them and have them pray for us or give us a, a, some godly advice. And, and Miss Delray was just that type of person. Uh, the very first funeral that I, that I did... And I wasn't even a pastor yet, but it was for a, um, a two-year-old twin, not both, but just one. One had passed away. And, uh, you know, funerals are hard. And to get baptized by fire like that was, was pretty tough. But I can remember before we went into that area uh, to, to have our service, it was pretty uh, unconventional type of a funeral service. But uh, Delray uh, took me by the hand and prayed for me there. And uh, I could really feel the presence of God in that prayer. So I thank the Lord for her and her life. And uh, I know she's up there with Mama. Mama beat her to it, though. Beat her up to heaven. So. Uh, amen. Lots of people are being uh, adversely affected with the coronavirus. And we're seeing more and more people um, coming or testing positive for it. More and more people being affected by that. So let's, as we pray this morning, let's lift them up in prayer. Amen. Uh, some of them are actually having tests today, and they've asked us to be in prayer for them and their co-workers, so we're going to do that, cover them with prayer this morning. Anybody have an uh, unspoken request this morning or something you'd like for us to remember? Amen. All right, let's stand as we go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Join me as we pray. Father, we are so grateful this morning, God, that you are good. Lord, it is just beyond our understanding, our comprehension, or we know how how difficult it is for us as fallen human beings, as, as men and women, young people. Lord, we know how hard it is for us to be good on many occasions, Lord. Sometimes it's hard for us to be good just one time per day. But Lord, You are good eternally. There's never a time, never an hour, never a minute, a second, in all of time and stretches out into eternity, God, that You are not good. And so, Lord, we're so grateful that we know a good God. Lord, that you are good to us. You are good to others. You are good to your creation. And so, Lord, we're so grateful for that, Father. Thank you, Lord, that we, we come before a good and loving God this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for this testimony of Miss Delray. Thank you, Father, for, for the good and for the 
wonderful things that she has done and lord that you have done through her and lord thank you for that life that she's lived lord pray lord for her family continues to comfort them lord in these days thank you lord for people like her lord that speak into our life that that take us under their wing at times impart into us wisdom give us godly understanding give us encouragement in those times Lord, we thank you so much for them lord we lift up our nation to you our nation needs you so much we need you lord to to instill your love into our hearts Lord, we pray for the the vision to to be quenched or to stop to to be thwarted lord for the evil that is present in our world lord to be dissipated lord that you would just speak that word of of peace be still to the hearts and to the lives of of those today lord that have not that peace i pray lord that they could receive in some way lord hear hear the message hear the the gospel the fact that jesus loves them and died for them has taken away their sins lord they would hear that message receive him and by doing that receive the love of god into their hearts lord this world would be so radically changed lord if just just a few could do that father with our impact upon this world with the love that's that comes from god inside of us as it shines out we as the light of the world lord it's it's a changing thing father it changes not only us but it changes others lord help us to realize that we are those that light in the world help us lord to be an encouragement to others in jesus name during these times of difficulty lord we pray father for those that are sick with the uh, coronavirus we pray lord for their speedily recovery we pray lord for for their healing in jesus mighty name we pray for those who are being tested we ask father that your hand of protection to be upon them throughout the testing process and lord also that that those tests would return back negative they not be uh, a carrier not be infected by this in christ's name lord you are able to eradicate this thing that we as human beings seem unable to to do anything about we ask father for that in jesus name thank you lord pray for those that have other sicknesses as well many are not feeling well in their physical body many have other sicknesses many are in the hospital uh, with with desperate situations lord many have been given a prognosis this week lord that wasn't favorable we pray and ask for them in jesus name pray for those that are having other difficulties lord have upcoming appointments we just ask lord for the for the power of god to be upon them be upon their body lord that you would just touch those areas whether it be the physical body whether it be the the emotions or their mind lord you're able to to deal with every part of our human body every part of our person lord we thank you so much for all that you do for us god thank you for each and every person that's here today pray for those that aren't able to be with us here this morning for whatever reason pray lord that your your loving hand will be upon them in jesus name Pray for those that are traveling, Father, that you would give them those mercies as well. And Lord, as we, uh, we continue to go forward in this service, we're so grateful, Jesus, that you are here with us. Where two or three are gathered together in your name, you are there in the midst. Thank you, Jesus, for being here with us. And Lord, we just pray for your blessings as we continue on this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Remember, as we continue our social distancing and and those kinds of things we're not able to uh, pass around the offering plate or have our meet and greet but thank you so much for your giving the offering plates are back there on the uh, surround of the sound room it's felt and thank you so much for your giving and support if you give by way electronically uh, thank you for that uh, you can look us up on the easy tithe app look for vision church flomilton and it's a safe and secure way of giving thank you so much for supporting our ministry in those ways amen thank you lord Praise God. All right. I hope you guys brought your Bible this morning. And if you did, say amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Turn to the book of Old Testament book of Lamentations. Lamentations. I don't know the last time that I uh, preached or taught a message out of Lamentations. Some of you may not know where Lamentations is. Uh, look for the big book, Jeremiah. Right, and then turn to the right. When you find Jeremiah, and there you are. Lamentations. Lamentations actually means uh, a, a heartfelt expression of sorrow. It actually means weeping. Weeping. And for that reason and others, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. And Jeremiah had a long ministry. We're going to talk about that this morning as we go into that. And uh, Jeremiah penned these words for us in Lamentations, these five chapters. And today what we're going to do is try to pull out of that 
what we see in Jeremiah's life whenever we face discouragement. How many of you have been discouraged uh, this past year? Amen? My hand's up. I won't ask you, but how many of you have been discouraged yesterday? Amen. Amen. Uh, if you are alive, okay, if you're not in the ground, you have been discouraged, and you probably are going to continue to be discouraged in one way or another. Amen? It's a part of life. If you're living, there's going to come times of discouragement. What is discouragement? Well, you know, when you hear something good or you hear something that, that is awesome or hear something that's, that's wonderful, it's encouraging, right? Encouraging. You're encouraged. Courage is imparted to you. You know, Wow, you know, I'm so glad to see, you know, people in church this morning. It's encouraging to me. Wow, I'm so glad to see that person gave their life to the Lord. Man, that's encouraging. The, the kingdom's being enlarged. I'm so glad you're doing better. I'm so glad, you know, that, that, that God has, has touched your body. You know, I'm encouraged by that. But there's other things that we see in this world that are not encouraging, but discouraging. Amen? And in our time, in our day, with all that we are faced with, it is a, an easy thing to be discouraged, to be despondent, even to be, like we would see Jeremiah, even to be depressed in this way. Those things, those, those three uh, triplets, they're kind of hanging around together. Discouragement, despondency, and depression. They, they're, they're kind of those, those triplets that look just like each other, and they affect us in some of the same ways. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish between those two. But the, the good news is, is that God does not want us to stay in discouragement. We may get discouraged. You may get despondent. You may get depressed. But God doesn't want you to stay discouraged or despondent or depressed. There is a way out. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. Now, what we're going to see in, in Lamentations is a discouragement, the despondency, the depression of Jeremiah. It may astound you to realize that, that great men of God can get discouraged. They can get despondent. They could even get depressed. Now, Jeremiah, to give you some, some background of where we are so you can kind of feel Jeremiah's heart, and that's really, to me, the key in understanding Realizing lamentations that we've got to see Jeremiah's heart. We've got to feel what he's feeling. We've got to have the compassion that Jeremiah had for his people. And so to do that, let me tell you a little bit about Jeremiah. Then we're going to read a little bit in chapter 1. Our focus is going to be in chapter 3. But we're going to kind of set the table in chapter 1. Amen? Now Jeremiah, this Old Testament prophet, was alive around, and we can just kind of put terms of, of easy to remember, around 600 years before Christ, 600 B.C. And Jeremiah was a prophet of God. Jeremiah, the Lord told him in, in his, his book, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I, I called you before you were born. I separated you and called you to be a prophet. That's Jeremiah. And Jeremiah had a ministry of preaching that lasted 40 years. Now, some of you are not even 20 years old in here. Some of you might be 30. Some of you might be 40. Now, you think about it. If, if you're in some of those categories, you've been alive for a little while. If you're 20, multiply it. All right? If you're closer to 10, you know, figure it out and, and stretch it out and see. That's a long time. You think about it. You equal up to 40 years. That's a long time. It's a long time to be alive. Now, can you imagine having a ministry where you are, are prophesying, where you are preaching for 40 years? That's a long ministry. Now, here's what can really get, you know, our attention when we see the discouragement of Jeremiah. In his preaching, in his ministry, in his prophesying, you know how many co converts that Jeremiah had? Are y'all with me this morning? Say amen. Y'all heard of a goose egg before? All right. That's what Jeremiah's realization was in converts. Zero. Forty years. You say, oh, he must have been a terrible preacher. No. Wasn't a terrible preacher. His, his audience had the issue. You see, Jeremiah was prophesying to the people and letting them know, hey, you guys are, are living in sin. This idolatry, this, this harlotry that you're doing, 
you're moved away from God and God is going to come in and, and judge you. There's judgment coming. And the people didn't want to hear it. The people, you know, turned him off. The people decided, you know, they wasn't going to heed his message. And then through those 40 years, the time kept clicking closer and closer and closer until finally when we get into the book of Lamentation, judgment has come. You've heard probably of the Babylonian captivity, one of the, the famous marks in Israel's history. Israel had, had reached their peak up under David and King Solomon and really, you know, was uh, the apple of the eye in the world. They were, the, the, you know, the, the power of the world at one time. But here we find them now, they are slipped down, fallen, and become subjugated, become conquered. Nebuchadnezzar came in in three successive seizures, 605, 597, and 586. Now, you may say, well, why is that important? Well, you know some guys that were taken in those captivities. You remember Daniel and his three friends, correct? Yes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're, they're Babylonian names. You remember those guys? They were taken in the first succession. They were taken away to Babylon. There's another guy by the name of Ezekiel. You've heard of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was taken in the second incursion when he came in. And then in 586, Nebuchadnezzar came in, destroyed, leveled Jerusalem and the temple. Just destroyed it all. Jeremiah is witnessing that third incursion. Now, he's seen all the others prior to that. And Jeremiah was actually given an opportunity by the Babylonians to go wherever he wanted to go. He could, he could have left that place, but he chose to be among his people. And Jeremiah is witnessing the destroying of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. And during that time, Nebuchadnezzar had laid siege to this place for about 18 months. Over a million Jewish people died, starved to death, disease. They even resorted to cannibalism, mothers eating their own children because they were starving to death. It was a terrible, terrible time, you see, in Israel's history, in the, in the place of Judah where Jeremiah is at. And Jeremiah is seeing all these things, knowing that he's been prophesying about this, knowing that it was coming and preaching about it, and results because the people didn't turn back. And Jeremiah loved the Jewish people. He himself was one, of course, but he loved his brothers and sisters. He didn't want to just escape, but, but he had in his heart for the people to stay and to see what was taking place. And in doing that, he becomes this person who writes Lamentations, this book of weeping, the weeping prophet. Now, Jeremiah has a, a, a point of view, really, literally, that it is important for us to understand. There's a place called Jeremiah's Grotto. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. If you go over there in Israel, one day I want to go, but there's a place over there called Gordon's Calvary. And it's a place that's on top of, of Mount Moriah. You say, Mount Moriah? Where have I heard Mount Moriah before? Well, Bible students, you remember that in, in Genesis 22, a guy by the name of Abram was told to go and offer his son, the son that he loved. He had two, but remember, one, Ishmael was not the product of, of God's promise, the product of man's work. God didn't recognize Ishmael, but God had given Abraham and his wife Sarah, Abram at 99, Sarah, whenever she was 90, had given them a son, the son of promise. Well beyond their natural ability to have children, God gave them Isaac. And then in Genesis 22, God says, take your son Isaac and take him and offer him as a burnt offering. Abram did exactly that. He, he took him up, him and Ab uh, Isaac, and Isaac was probably, scholars, and, and I would uh, go this route too, believe he's probably around 33 years old at this time. So he's not a young lad, if we might think about it in the, in, the, uh, in the color books and things like that. Don't imagine a little tiny boy, okay? Uh, imagine a grown man. He takes him up, binds him, gets ready to offer the sacrifice. And you know the story. The angel come and he stopped him. And he says, stop, there's a substitute for you. There's a ram caught in the thicket. Don't kill your son. And so the, the ram was taken and offered in the place of Isaac. Isaac was not offered as a burnt offering, the ram was, a substitution was made. And Abraham sees something prophetic that, and he names that place where he is. He names it Mount Moriah. And what does that mean, Mount Moriah? Because he said, in, in, in the coming days, in the mount of the Lord, 
where they're at. This mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. What? What would be seen? Well, 2,000 years later, there would be another father who offered his only begotten son on that same place. Calvary's Hill, Mount Moriah. This time there would not be a substitute because Jesus himself was the substitute. Amen? So what Abram was prefiguring there and offering Isaac, what that mountain was named, was pointing to Jesus, who, who is our substitute. Paul says, He who knew no sin became sin, Amen. that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He's a propitiation for our sins. Who? Jesus. He had no sins himself, but he took all of our sins. He became our substitute and paid for those things on Calvary's cross right there. Amen. You know that place is called... Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. You've heard that before, correct? Well, in Jerusalem, there is a, a, a mountain range that runs, um, has its peak right there on Mount Moriah. And it runs on further, I believe it goes down to the northern gate outside the city. But it's that mountain range, it's Mount Moriah. And there is a place there on Gordon's Calvary that they call Jeremiah's Grotto. And you know the place of the skull, actually this place actually looks like a skull. It's got, it's, it's the round part of the skull. It's got the, the two eye sockets, you know, as you can see. It does have the appearance of a skull. Jeremiah's grotto is where Jeremiah was detained in prison, the scholars believe. It's the high point. You can look down upon Calvary's Hill and you can look down upon the city. That's his vantage point. That's his viewpoint. And it's believed by many scholars that Jeremiah's grotto is one of the eye sockets of the skull. That's where he was. In prison. Hemmed in. But with a perfect view of all the destruction that's taking place down in Jerusalem. The city that he loved. The city where the temple was. The city where the worship of God was. He's got a viewpoint from, from this place, from Jeremiah's grotto, that allows him to see the destruction of Jerusalem. So hopefully these things are, are now maybe getting you a little bit of insight into Jeremiah's heart. Now look at, at chapter 1, if you will, and listen to these words and, and try to feel the heart of Jeremiah if you can. Amen? Starting at verse 1, we're not going to read the entire chapter, but just to give you a, a, a flavor for this. And he says, How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. How like a widow is she, who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces hath now become a slave. You see, Jerusalem, this city that he loved, it, it, it was the pinnacle. It, it was a place. There would you know, be millions of people here on those feast days. It would just be teeming with people. Be just all types of great things taking place as well as the worship of God. But the teaching of God, the praise of God, all the temple things taking place, all the people there. You know, they used to be this place that would, people would look up to. They were the place, you know, that, that people aspired to be like these people, like the Jewish people, like Israel. And once there was a time whenever they were like the, on the top, but now you see they were the slaves. They were the ones that was put into subjugation by the others. And Jeremiah sees that. He realizes the, the state of this place and it, it breaks his heart. And he says this, he said, bitterly she weeps at night. Speaking about Jerusalem. Tears are upon her cheeks. Among all her lovers there is none to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. He's talked about her lovers. You see, Jeremiah is speaking about the fact that, that Israel had played the harlot with God. They had went after other gods. You know, seeking after this God, seeking after this God, the, the gods of foreign nations, and they had left Jehovah God, the one true God. And God considers that you've, you've played the harlot with me. You, you've, you've prostituted yourself. And he's saying, your, your lovers, where are they now? Amen. You see, these gods that they were serving had no power. They could not save, they couldn't rescue, they couldn't defend the people. And so Jeremiah is saying, you know, your, your God, they, they've abandoned you. 
You know, your friends, you thought that you had these allies, these other countries, you know, that were, that were giving you high fives and, and all these things. Now where are they? They're laughing. They're your enemies. Their true identity has come out. And he says, after affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. He's speaking about these three exiles that we spoke about with Daniel, with Ezekiel. Now, finally, all the people, except for that little small, tiny remnant that would perish under the hands of these, these soldiers of Nebuchadnezzar in the destruction of the city. That was all that was left. Everybody else had been taken out. They've been put into other places all around the, 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 the world of, of the Babylonian Empire, if it was. She dwells among the nations and she finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn. For no one comes to her appointed feast. You know, they had seven feasts in Israel. Three of those, if you were, if you were able, if you were healthy, if you were a male, you were, you were, it was obligated to you to attend. It wasn't an issue. If you were uh, able to travel, if you were healthy, you were supposed to be there. And there would be millions of, of these pilgrims coming into Jerusalem from all different places, from the north and from the south. And they would be traveling. The roads would just be packed with these, these pilgrims. And the gates of the city, you know, people coming in the gates, people walking out of the gates, all kinds of the bazaars that were taking place there, you know, the, the marketplace, the, the, the temple worship, the sacrifices, the worship of God, all those things. It was just a tremendously busy place, Jerusalem. And he says, the roads, where are they? They're empty. It'd be like, it'd be like I-65, you get out on that, and there's not a soul on it. Can you imagine? That's what Jeremiah is saying. He said, you know, there's, there's no one here. The roads are empty. No travelers. There, there's no people at the gates. And he says this. He says, all of her gateways are desolate. Her priests groan. Instead of them, them praising God, instead of them leading the worship, instead of them teaching and doing the, the temple services, they're just sitting there groaning. Her maidens are grieving. She is in bitter anguish. Verse 5, her foes have become her masters. Her enemies are at ease. They're just sitting back. They, the, the, Jerusalem has fallen. There's nothing for us to worry about ever again with these people. That's what they're saying. They're at ease. The Lord has brought her grief. Wow. Why? Because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile, captive before the foe. All the splendor has departed from the daughter of Zion. Her princes, you know, the, the ruling class, you know, the, the, the class there of Judah and those. Her princes are like deer. Deer that find no pasture. In weakness, they have fled before the pursuer. You know how you guys and, and girls that hunt, you know how easy it is to, to, uh, to cause a deer to move? It's not hard at all. They catch the right whiff of, 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 of your scent, and they're gone. You know, a little, one little crack of something, and they're gone. And that, that's the way the pursuer is there in hunt of the deer. And it's saying that Israel, the, the princes, the people that are in charge, the, the, the rulers, they're like those deer that are hunted heavily. And they, they got no pasture, they got no place to run. They're constantly moving, constantly on the run. In the days of her affliction and wandering, Jerusalem remembers all the treasures that were hers in days of old. They're thinking about the glory days. Remember how it was during the time of, of David. How it was in, the, in his exploits. How it was in the time of Solomon in the building of this humongously wonder of the world, the temple. When her people fell in the enemy hands, there was no one to help her. Her enemies looked at her, laughed at her destruction. Jerusalem, verse 8, has sinned greatly. And so has become unclean. All who honored her despise her. For they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns away. Her filthiness clung to her skirts. She did not consider her future. Her fall was astounding. You know, that's really the way that sin always does. Isn't it? He says... You know, they didn't contemplate the future. They didn't, they didn't realize or think about what it's going to be like if we continue in this sin. What's it going to be like if we continue this idolatry? What's it going to be like if we continue 
to, to thwart God and disobey God. They never thought there would be any repercussions. Do you hear what Jeremiah is saying? Oh, y'all got to help me. Do you, can you hear the heart of Jeremiah? He's, he's saying, you know, you, you didn't never thought that it would come to a head. You never thought the future would ever arise. There'd be a, a payment that had to be made. Amen. But you know, sin is always that way. Yes, amen. Sin is always going to, it's going to cost you more than you ever thought. Amen. It's going to take you further than you ever thought you'd go. And it's always going to leave you more desolate than you ever thought you would be. Yes. Always, always, always. And he says this, he says, the enemy has laid hands on all her treasures. Speaking about the plunder of the, of the temple. She saw pagan nations enter her sanctuary. Those you had forbidden to enter your assembly. All her people groan as they search for bread. They barter their treasures. For what? For food. To keep themselves alive. Look, O oh Lord. And consider, for I am despised. Now, Jeremiah, you can understand now why this book's called Lamentations. Amen? Now, this book, Lamentations, is a poetic book. And what I mean by that? Well, in the sense that the way it is constructed, if we had the Hebrew Bibles, which we probably couldn't read, but if we could read them, we, we find something very wonderful about the way that Jeremiah wrote this these five chapters. It's in the form the poetic of a, an acrostic in the sense that, that he would take the first letter of the Hebrew alpha, alphabet, which would be the Aleph, and he would take that and he would start one verse. And then he would take the, the next verse, the Beth, excuse me, the next letter, the Beth, and he would start the next verse, verse 2. And then he would came, come to the third verse of Gimel and take that one and start the next verse. And if you'll notice, even in our English Bible, you'll see that there's 22 verses in chapter 1. There's 22 verses in chapter 2. There's 22 verses in chapter 4 and also chapter 5. 5 gets off a little bit, and I'll talk about that in just a second. The reason is because he takes one verse and applies it to one letter. As it goes down to A, B's, and the C, like we would, amen? You realize this, that, that, that our ABC's, we call it what, the alphabet? You know where that comes from? The Aleph and the Bet. The first two letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Amen? You didn't know that, did you? You thought that was just something cute that they had, a, you know, the little cereal box with, didn't you? In the English, you know, we can kind of see it, you know, in the sense that there's 22, but we can't really get the flavor of it like we could if we could actually read Hebrew. Now, I skipped chapter 3, because chapter 3 is our focus. You know why I skipped chapter 3? Because chapter 3, he goes off a little bit, but he enhances it. It's not 22, but it's 66. 66. So chapters 1 and 2, 22. Chapters 4 and 5, 22. Chapters 3 and right in the middle, you know, got two on both sides. It's 66. 66 verses. Well, how does he do that, Rick? Well, he takes the, the Aleph and he goes what? 1, 2, 3. Takes the Beth and 4, 5, and 6. Takes the, the, the Gimel, 7, 8, and 9. Are you following me? Yeah. And that way, three verses for every letter. And it, it forms out now when you get to the very end, that 22 times 3 is 66. Now, why is that important, Rick? Well, if you can kind of put it out on a piece of paper, if you could put that, you know, uh, line it up, you're going to find out that just as well as you're going to have the 22 and the 22 and the 22 and the 22 and the 66 is going to be three times as high. If you was to now connect the dots, you've got almost like a mountain range, don't you? Are you following me? Now, that's important. You say, oh, you, that's just kind of, that's just a coincidence. Well, Maybe, maybe not. Here, here's why I say maybe not. You see, Jeremiah, he's down, you know, the, the mountain always leads down to the, to the valley. Correct? Amen. Jeremiah's in the valley. The valley of what? Despair. The valley of discouragement. The valley of, of despondency. The valley of depression. He's down there. But something happens in chapter 3. In chapter 3, Jeremiah has a breakthrough. You ever, you ever had a breakthrough? You know, you felt like you're in a, in, a, in a steel ball, you know, maybe you're in a, a stone cave, you know, and there, there's nothing, you're surrounded. But then all of a sudden you see a little chip in the, in the metal, you see a little crevice, a little crack there in the stone, and there's some light that's teeming out. All of a sudden you say, man, I'm, a, I'm about to have a breakthrough, I'm about to break out 
of this cave. I'm about to break out of this steel ball that I'm encased in in this despondency and in this despair and in this discouragement. Amen? Are you with me? Jeremiah's going to have a breakthrough in chapter 3. And so now we've heard that his heart. Now, we could continue on, but it's dark. You can already tell. It's dark, amen? It's, 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 it's deep. It's dark. It's sorrowful. Yeah. Jeremiah's weeping. We should remind you, there was another person that wept. Another prophet. Amen. His name was Jesus, not Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, just like is weeping over Jerusalem, Jesus there, 600 years later, will look over the city, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and weep over her. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together like a hen does her chicks, but you would not. He, he's saying, you know, I would, have, I would have brought you to me, but you didn't want it. Yeah. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't say, you know, like we might would do. We might would if we were Jeremiah. We might would if we were Jesus. We might would say, you know what, you're getting what's coming to you. You know what, I told you so. You know what? <laughs> Enjoy the wages of what you've earned. But is that Jeremiah? Is that Jesus? No. Jesus weeps. Jeremiah weeps. They knew it was coming. Jesus made the offer. They rejected him. And Jesus, instead of saying, you know, I'm glad you're finally going to pay for your rejection, Jesus instead is weeping over the city. Why? Because Jesus loves the people in that city. They're their own people. But he loves all people. How it must break the heart of God whenever he sees the, the rejection of people that he's died for. Oh, help us, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. But in, in Lamentations 3, going up to the top of this mountain, Jeremiah's going to break out. He's going to break out of this discouragement. And for me and you, if we can see what Jeremiah did, if we can pull those treasures out of, of this book of Lamentations, this dark book of sorrow, of grief, of tears, if we can pull that out, we can, you and me, we, we can get discouraged, but we've never been discouraged like Jeremiah. You may be despondent, but we've got nothing on Jeremiah. You may have been dis uh, depressed, but not like Jeremiah. Amen. Sitting in, in that little eye socket of that skull, nowhere to go, burdened down, face to see the destruction that could have been prevented. Amen. So what does he do? Thank you, Lord. Y'all still with me? Amen? Amen. You've heard about his affliction. Come with me, if you will, in... Lamentation. Turn over to chapter 3 and come down to verse 21. Come down to verse 21. Chapter 3 and verse 21. Now, let me give you this where it can hopefully tie us in. If you haven't already tied yourself in, you see, you and me, we're kind of like Jeremiah. We're perched in Jeremiah's grotto. What do you mean, Rick? I'm not in a, the, the skull. I'm not in a, a cave. No, but you know what? We're, we're in a place and, and we've got a viewpoint that looks out on this world right now, today. And you know what? We see things that, that make us sick. We see people that hate other people. We see people that want to want to hurt, want to kill, want to torture other people. We see racial divide. We see this group hates this group and that group hates them. And it's promoted and it, it, it's, it's celebrated in some ways, in some places. You know, we see that and we're, we're, like, we're like locked away in, in our grotto and we're saying, you know, this makes me sick. This, this hurts me. This, this is something that pains me. Yeah. We're seeing, you know, the, the political realm where this party is going to do everything they can to destroy this party. And this party in return is going to about face and do the same. Yeah. You know, and, and everybody, it seems like, has got, you know, that I'm right and everybody else is wrong. Yeah. And whatever you say, it, it must be because you hate yeah. everybody. Just because you've gotten pain. And we see that and we're saying, what? Our world is crazy. Jeremiah saw his world on fire. You and I, we look out and we say, man, our world, we see cities are destroyed. We see the looting. We see the crime. We see the defacing. And, you know, our world, maybe perhaps for the first time, and we, we maybe have seen it, not all of us, but maybe for the first time, it's now starting to, to, to enter into our spirit that these things are bad. We got the, you know, the virus, it seems like there's nothing can be done about it. And it seems like, you know, man, it's just going to, it's, it's done affected us physically. It's affected us monetarily, financially. It's affected us spiritually. 
You know, and if you look on the, on the list of the dangerous places, you know what's right there at the very top? If you had a list of ten, and I've seen the list of ten, you know what's right there in the position of number nine, the number nine place that's most dangerous? The church. The church. Are you, can, you, can you really see from your grotto, you know, from your device, and you're, you're flipping up, and, and everything, it's not just every week now, it's every hour. There's something else. There's something taking place. And if you're, you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, there's plenty there to get you despondent. There's plenty there to discourage you, not encourage you. There are some good things to encourage you. Praise God. Praise God for that. Amen. But there's a lot of things that, that we are, are forced by way of just being in this world that we have to, we have to see. Amen. And it can be discouraging instead of encouraging. Yes. So what, is, what can we do? What did Jeremiah do? Look at verse 21, chapter 3, verse 21. Everybody still good? Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 21. He says, yet this I call to mind. Now, if you look back at verse 17, he says, I've been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor is gone. And all that I had hoped from the Lord is gone. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. Jeremiah's depressed. He's discouraged. He's despondent. Well, what does it say, verse 21? Yet this I call to mind. See, the Lord stepped into that grotto, stepped into that eye socket where Jeremiah was, and filled it with His grace, and allowed Jeremiah in the midst, in the very bottom of that pit, that he was locked in not only physically, but also emotionally and spiritually. God entered that place and allowed Jeremiah's mindset to change. And look what he said. He says, and therefore, what? Oh, I have what? I have hope. He just said a few minutes earlier, just a, you know, a few verses earlier, my hope is gone. The prosperity, I don't even know what it's like. I don't even know what it's like to have hope anymore. It's hope from God is gone. And it, but all of a sudden, Man, that crevice, it just, it's like breaking open, and he's about to have this breakthrough. And what does he do? It starts where? It starts in the mind. And he says, I have hope. Why would Jeremiah have hope in the midst of this despondency? The city's on fire. The people are, 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 are cannibal, cannibals in there. The people are, are being destroyed. They're being run out. They're dying. They're diseased. And look what he says, verse 22. Why does he have hope? Because of the Lord's great love Amen. what 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 because of the lord's great love? there's something coming after that because of the lord's great love he says we are not consumed you see picture jeremiah again he's looking out he's seeing the consumption as it was of all the people there he's seeing the people burned alive he's seeing the people being speared he's seeing the people cut in two he's seeing the people starving people ravaged with disease and all these things taking place, the soldiers in there just destroying everything. It would probably seem in those people's days, you know, in their time, like the world was ending. You know, they didn't have the, the, the iPhone. They couldn't look and say what's like, going to be like in the next city. To them, this was their world. It looks like, you know, the world is over. But Jeremiah, in seeing all that, what does he say? He says this. He says, it's because of the Lord's great love that we are not consumed. We're not consumed. See, he's seeing those people be consumed, and he's thinking right now, you know what? It's, it's a miracle. It's a wonder. It's unbelievably true that I, Jeremiah, am not consumed. Now, what would make Jeremiah think that? Well, he's seeing what's taking place. He's seeing those people be consumed. It's starting to, to, to realize that he's a little bit separated from them in this, in this cave. But if it wasn't for God's love, Jeremiah says, we would be consumed. You see, the reality is Jeremiah thinks about something that we need to think about. If we're, if we're in a place where we are, are despondent, depressed, 
If we're in a place where we're discouraged, we've got to realize this, guys, that, that we, although we're, we, we, we're in a bad situation, we may think, although we're in a, a ter terrible situation where our world's on fire, we are not getting consumed. We're still alive. What are you talking about, Rick? Well, look, look on just a minute with me. We're not consumed for His compassions never fail. Speaking about the Lord. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord. You see that where He says the, 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 they are new every morning. His compassions never fail. Your version may have His mercies there. Amen? You know, there's a the part of the song that we, we talk about where we say, you know, His, his mercies, they're, they're new every morning. What's that talking about? What is all this coming to where Jeremiah is saying these things, that the compassions never fail, they're new every morning, great is your faithfulness. He's talking about God's faithfulness, God's mercies, God's compassion toward Him. Now, Rick, I still don't understand. Well, what we have to realize is that, that as he sees Israel suffering for their sins, that he realizes that he himself is not suffering for his sin. And that's what we have to realize. So you see, when, when we get real, now this is deep, okay? This is, this is not shallow, guys. This is going to be deep. And you've got you to realize if, if you want to find a, a way out, we've got to realize this truth, okay? That when we sin, the Bible tells us, God's Word tells us, that the wages of sin is what? It's death. The wages of sin. Sin, like an employer, you know, you work for somebody, you work 40 weeks, you put in your sweat and your time, you're trading your time for, for their money. And whenever you work those 40 hours, you work those wages, you know, you say, you know what, I am, I am deserving of a paycheck. I've earned this paycheck. And I've, I've done this for you now. I need this money, right? And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But Paul talks about the fact that sin pays wages too. Whenever we sin, we have to realize this fact. When we sin, the master, Satan, is going to pay wages. There's going to be always wages to pay. And you go into the Old Testament, it says the soul that sins shall surely die. Well, I'll, I'll just talk, Rick. Well, if we realize the very... The truth of those two scriptures I just gave you. The wages of sin is death. We also could put in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Is everybody with me today? And, and all would be all of us. Now here's what I'm trying to get you to see. Is that if, if God were not merciful, if God were not compassionate, we would all perish. We would all be in this place of being consumed. That's the reality. You, you've got to understand that. If, if you've ever wanted to get out, if you ever want to realize the, the goodness of God, the compassion of God, the mercies of God, you've got to understand that truth. Amen. Is that the things that we have done in being disobedient to God, the things that we've done in rebelling against God, we've broken His Word, every single one of us, the one up here standing before you, all of us, all have sinned. And you know what? We're deserving of what? Yes. Being consumed. Why? Because God's in charge and, and those are His rules. Yes. Not ours, not mine, but the Lord. Amen. And so what is it then that Jeremiah sees as he's looking at this city being destroyed and there, he himself is not being destroyed, he himself is still alive. He says, you know, it's, it's, if I could paraphrase Jeremiah to you, what I think he's trying to let me in, you know, is that, you know, it's, it's a wonder that I'm not consumed. Yes. Israel's suffering for her sins. I, Jeremiah, not a perfect man, I should really be consumed. Amen. Here's what I'm trying to get you guys to understand. Whenever we are despondent, when we are down, when we are, are beat up and de depressed and discouraged, the thing that we have to realize is, you know, as bad as it is, you know what? I'm not destroyed. Amen. I haven't been consumed. I haven't been annihilated. Yeah. And you see, if the, if the Lord wasn't merciful, I would be. Amen. If the Lord wasn't compassionate, I would be. See, we, we put these words out there, and one of those words that we use kind of loosely is this word mercy. Well, you kind of use it, we kind of attach it to something. We hear something, you know, kind of, kind of wild. We say, oh, mercy. You know, we, we kind of throw it out, kind of nonchalant. But you know what that word really means? It means not getting what we deserve. Amen. Not getting. And so, 
if the wages of sin is death, if all the sin comes short of the glory of God, then what we deserve, if we're truly honest, we deserve death. But you know what God does? God steps into our life. He steps into our world. And His mercy is granted to us. Yeah. Meaning, you don't have to get what you deserve. Amen. Why? Because I'm granting you mercy. Amen. I'm granting you mercy. Amen. And the Bible tells us that there are new mercies every morning. Do you realize that? You, I don't know about you guys, but I need a, a brand new batch of mercies every morning. <laughs> you see, there's things that we do during the day. And, and, and we do them during the day. And, and the Lord, instead of wiping us out, annihilating us, you know, zapping us or whatever, there's mercy granted to us. Not getting what you deserve. And some of you are kind of rolling your eyes, maybe, you know, in your heart. Maybe you're saying, oh, I don't buy all that, Rick. Let me ask you this question. Okay? That personalize it for you, okay? Imagine that just any day, any day of your life was, was put on film. Not only what you did, but what you thought. Are y'all with me? Any, just any day. Take, take one day of your life, have it filmed, everything that you did and everything that you thought, and then played for all to see. One day. One day. Okay? Your actions and your thoughts. Now multiply that by all the days of your life. Okay? Are you with me so far, right? Okay. Now, how many of us would love to be the one that stood up to run mine first? We would be like, it's the smallest little crack that you could find. We'd be like the little mouse trying to go in it, wouldn't we? Right? Amen? We'd be, the, you know, just a ball. The, the reality is God has that film. It's, it's not literal film. It's not on God's iPhone. It's, it's up here, right? And you know what? Can you imagine if, if you put yourself now away from that, being the one who's filmed now to the one who's having to watch it? Put yourself in God's shoes there, and you're watching that film roll, and you're seeing all the hatred. You're seeing all the lies. You're seeing all the, the, the hypocrisy. You're seeing all of the rebellion. You're seeing all of the betrayal. I mean, you just continue, and you're seeing that. How many of us, probably after just a few seconds, would say, enough? Amen. I would, you know. I, I say, I've seen enough, you know. Amen. Wipe it out, let's start over. But God doesn't do that. Why? Because He's full of compassion. You know what compassion means? The word compassion means allowing someone else's hurt to enter you. You see, that's what God, He's full of compassion. He allows the hurts and the sorrow of the world to, to enter into Him. He's full of compassion. Jesus, you know, when He was walking, as He saw the people that they were like sheep without a shepherd, He had compassion on those people. When He saw that the people, you know, had not eaten in days, He had compassion on them because they were hungry. The Lord is a compassionate God. Jesus is, is a compassionate Savior. And He's moved, you see, by the hurts of the world. And he, he looks at that, you know, throughout the course of the day, that film that's rolling, you know, instead of wiping us out, no, he said, I got mercy for that. I got mercy for that. Oh, I got some mercy for that too. Here's some mercy, not getting what you do deserve. See, a lot of times whenever we're depressed, whenever we are discouraged, we're, we're sad about what we don't have. I don't have, you know, see, you don't, somebody else has got it, you know, and, oh, I wish I had that. Why, they got it. I'm more deserving than them. Right? Come on, somebody. Y'all don't do that, but other people do. Okay? You ought to be glad that you don't have what you don't want. Amen. What don't I want, Rick? You don't want what you deserve. Amen. If we're truthful, if we're truthful here this morning, we are so glad that God is merciful, that He does not give us what we deserve. Man, I'm so glad. I'll let you guys think, but I'm so glad Amen. that I don't get what I deserve. Amen. Why? Because the mercies of God, because He's compassionate. And He tells us that those mercies are new every morning. Any, any of you guys ever got to, I mean, you've been a, had a rough day, had a stressful day. Maybe you're ill. Maybe you, you run out of patience. Maybe you're aggravated. 
Maybe you're down and you just say, you know what, I got to go to bed. I, 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 I've had enough. Anybody? Okay, I got to. Everybody in here is saints, so nobody has that problem. So I'm having to instruct y'all on the way things sometimes work, okay? And you say, I just, no, I got to go to bed. I got to go to bed. Why? Because this day that you're in, you're saying, you know, I, I just can't cope anymore. You know, I'm, I'm biting everybody's head off. Everything somebody says is bothering me. You know, I'm upset. I'm tired. I'm angry. I'm ill. You know, and I just got to go to bed. And you know what? What a, what a good night's sleep does for you, doesn't it? Amen? You know what the Lord does for us during that time? You see, when we go to sleep, you know, we're awake 12 hours, 18 hours of the day. God has designed these bodies here to where they've got to recuperate. They've got to refresh. Correct? And, and sleep does that. Sleep re-energizes the body. It gives us the rest that we need. You know, you actually lose your mind if you just stay awake and never go to sleep. Clinically proven fact. You just go nuts. you got to have that sleep. And, and you, you wake up, and you know what? Things have changed, you know? You're not as ill as you once were. You're not as angry as you once were, right? What's happened? During the course of the night, you know what the Lord has done? The Lord has gathered together a whole new bag, a box of mercies. And He's deposited them in your account. His new mercies are new every morning. Every morning, you've got a brand new batch of mercies to go through. Amen? Amen. That's, that's the goodness of God. Amen. That, that His mercies are new every morning. Amen. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. You know, whenever we, we, we go to sleep, you know, we, we kind of appear, if you weren't breathing, it would kind of appear that you have died. Some people, you know, they have that desire. You know, I just want to go to, go to sleep one night and, and not wake up and be in heaven, you know be awesome amen and you know when jesus and paul the apostle when they speak about christians that are actually dead you know what he says about them they're asleep they're asleep lazarus he's asleep oh if he's asleep he's, let's don't bother him no he's dead he'll tell the disciples oh and paul says we're asleep in jesus you know sleep in that way of, of thinking of what we've talked about when we get to that point where we say I'm done with this day. We got to say something like this: I got to die to this day. Amen. This day, this day's got to be over. I got to die to this day, so I'm going to sleep. Right. And so when we get to that place where we say, you know, this day is over. This day is, it is done. You know, I've extinguished and used up all the mercies of this day. God gives us a brand new set of mercies for the next. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So the first thing that you need to do is reflect on God's mercy. Reflect on God's mercy. Amen. Think about the Lord and say, Lord, it's so great that you haven't destroyed me. Amen. It's so great that I don't get what I deserve. Things aren't great right now. A lot of things that, that I, I want that I don't have, but I'm so grateful for the things that I don't have that I don't want. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Everybody still okay? Amen. Man, where is our, our, our time going? All right. I've got I've to jump ahead. The second thing is that Jeremiah reflected on the satisfaction that he finds in God. He realized that the Lord's mercies and the Lord's compassion, the Lord's goodness was there for him every single day. But then he also realized this here in verse 24. Look at it with me. Everybody still good? I say to myself, sometimes you've got to talk to yourself. You realize that? You know, David, David's spirit said to his soul, soul, we've got to worship God. His, his spirit, the part of him that is in tune with God, spoke to David, soul, soul. Wake up, soul. Time to worship the Lord. Sometimes we've we got to speak to our, ourselves in that way. Jeremiah says, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. He didn't, he didn't say the Lord gives me my portion. He didn't say, you know, the Lord grants me a portion. He says, the Lord is my portion. Amen. See, a lot of times whenever we're, we're discouraged, we think that what we need from, from Jesus is something He can provide for us, something He can give to us. That's not what Jeremiah is saying here. He doesn't say, the, the Lord gives me a portion. He doesn't say, the Lord grant me a portion. You know, for, for us, we might say, you know, Lord, what I need right now is this. And we name this. 
Lord, what I re- need right now is to be free from, from that. And we named that. What Jeremiah is, is trying to let us know is that's not going to be the answer. See, whenever we put our stock in those things, if we're living, in, in other words, for some things, you're going to always come up empty. If you're living for your spouse, if you're, if you're living for your paycheck, if you're living for the game, if you're living for the concert, if you're, if you're living for the car, or the boat, or the next episode, you know what? You're always going to be disappointed. Amen. Always. Because that's going to come, and it's going to go, and you're still not satisfied. Amen. Are you following me? Amen. You know, the, the, the gift's going to come, and then it's going to get old. And you're going to say, well, what's the next gift? Amen? Amen. The concert's going to come, and it's going to go. And it's gonna, well, I thought that would be satisfying, but I feel kind of empty. Where's the next one? The paycheck comes, and you know you, you, you dab it all out. But well, where's the next one coming? Come on. Are you following me? You're always going to be disappointed. You're always going to be discouraged. You're always going to be feeling left empty. And there's going to be this constant pursuit of the next. You know, what's the next thing we can do? What's the next place we can go? What's the next object that I can acquire? Why? Because it never fully satisfies. And so Jeremiah realizes that, and he says, Lord, it's not that I want you to to give me a a portion, but Lord, you are my portion. You see, what we're really looking for is the Lord. It's the Lord that satisfies. You see, Jesus Jesus never says, you know what, I, I, I give you bread for your portion. No, what does he say? He says, I am the bread. The bread of life. Jesus doesn't say, let me show you the door. No, He says, I am the door. Amen. You see the difference? Yeah. See, see we're, a lot of times we may be thinking, well, what I really need is for the Lord to give me a portion, to give me this or give me that. No, what you really want, what you really need is the Lord Himself. It's the Lord Himself that satisfies. Yeah. You know, Corey Tim Boone, the, 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 the great lady, the, the survivor of the concentration camps in Nazi Germany, she said, you never realize that the Lord is all you need until you realize that the Lord is all you have. Amen. I don't know if, if you've ever been in a, in a really tough place. I'm, I'm talking about a tough place. I'm not talking about, you know, you know the 12 o'clock and, and you've got to stay till 12, 30 to eat lunch. I'm talking about a tough spot. And, and there's nothing else there but the Lord. What you find out when you're in that tough spot, that in that time, that the Lord was really all that you really needed. And, and you thought you really needed that, and you thought you really needed this, but, but in that time when the Lord was all that you had, and you drew close to the Lord, and the Lord drew close to you, and you had this wonderful communion with the Lord, and you realize, you know what, Lord... I, I thought I needed that, and I, I, I wanted this, but Lord, I realized that, Lord, it was just you that I was after the whole time. That's the, that's the secret. That's what Jeremiah is saying. I, I realize that the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I'm going to wait on Him. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, man, I've got to... I'm out of time. Five more minutes, anybody? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Look at verse 40 and 45. Excuse me, 40 and 41, excuse me. Very quickly. Things, practical things that we can do. These are things that we, we, we think about. We think about the mercies of God. We're not consumed. We think about the reality that the Lord is our portion. Here's some practical things that we can do. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 4. Let us examine our ways and test them. Let us return to the Lord. You see, He wants us to do some, some inward examination. Just two parts of this, very quickly. Inward examination. We, we just simply ask, Lord, is there some way that I need to correct my course? You know, you, you're despondent, you're discouraged, you're depressed. Lord, is there some way, Lord, examine my heart and show me, is there a course correction that needs to be made? 
Is, is there something there, Lord, that, that I'm not doing that you need to correct? You remember Peter, Peter, this great fisherman, you know, born probably, I don't know if he's born and raised, but he made his living on the, on the Sea of Galilee, and he's out there, and the waves are coming, about to destroy him, about to take down his boat, and all of a sudden he sees this figure coming, that's coming on top of the storm, on top of the waves. He's being tossed and turned and, and flipped around like a little toy, and here's one steady coming toward him. And he said, Lord, is, is that you? Bid me to come. In other words, if that's you, Jesus, tell me to come. And Jesus says, come. And Peter, out of some kind of boldness that come over him, I don't know what happened. It had to be the Lord. He steps out of the boat and into the water. But what he finds out is, is he's looking at the one who's looking back at him, Jesus. He's not sinking. He, he, he's walking on water. But you know, the moment comes whenever he what? He takes his eyes off the Lord and he begins to sink. In that time, does Peter have a, have a discourse, a, a, excuse me, a, a theological explanation of the, of the intricacies and the form of prayer? No, <laughs> he don't have time for that. What does Peter do? Save me. Amen. And you know what? The Lord does exactly that. Picks him up, picks him up. You see, that, that's me and you. You see, when we got our eyes on the Lord, the one that's above your storm, the one that is above your problems, your difficulties, your despondency, your discouragement, when you've got your eyes on the one who's over, able to overcome all things, you know what? Then we can move out of the boat of our storm, out of our discouragement, our depression, and we can move out there with the Lord. If we keep our eyes on Him, if we keep our focus on Him. Thank you, Lord. And the, the last thing is this, that we've got to, We've got to do something outwardly. This is important. This is important. Look at verse, uh, excuse me, verse, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Verse 41. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands amen. to God in heaven. Everybody see that? Amen. Not only do we make that inner correction, we see who it is that we're looking to. If I'm looking to that, I'm going to be disappointed. But if I'm looking to Jesus, He's going to bring me through. We've got to do this outward thing too. And what does He say? He says, we lift up our hands Amen. and our hearts. You see, your hands and your hearts are connected. Yes, when, when we go to a ball game, and I do the same thing. You know, when I see one, one of my, my team, if I see them score or inter, you know, make an interception or make a sack, or one of them make a dunk or something like that, you know, the, the natural expression is to do what? Stand up, raise her hands, and holler, you know, woo, like that, right? No problem with that. Nothing wrong with that. But you know what? We, we, because we, we don't have that same type of a natural inclination, you see, for the things of God, those things that are natural to us have to be redirected. Redirected toward God. Redirected Godward. So that whenever we come into the very presence of God, we got to raise our hearts. But you see, our hearts are, are connected to our hands. Amen. And so it's the, it's the hands that are lifted up to heaven. When you lift up your hands sincerely to the Lord, your heart is lifted up as well. Amen? Amen? Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The solution for today, for me and you, is the same as it was for Peter, the same as it was for Jeremiah is that we've got to take our eyes off of those things that we're depending on. Yes. Off of those things we think are going to bring satisfaction, going to bring fulfillment, going to bring the happiness. And we, with lifted hands and, and corresponding lifted heart, we look to the Lord. The Lord is your portion. The Lord is compassionate. The Lord loves you. And the Lord can take you out from that chapter 1 and chapter 2. And bring you up to that high place in chapter 3. Where you have the breakthrough. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you, Lord, for your precious people, Lord, for their patience this morning. Lord, thank you, Father, that you love us so greatly. Lord, that your compassion, your mercies are new every day, Lord. How much we need them, God. Thank you so much, Lord, for, for giving them to us each and every single day. Lord, help us this morning. Lord, in our despair and our discouragement, as we sit and we, we view the things in our world that are bringing us down, causing us to be so discouraged and so despairing, 
Lord, help us to, to move our eyes off of those things and move them towards You. Father. Help us to, to look heavenward. Help us to look to You, Jesus. Fix our eyes and our focus upon You, Lord. Realize that You, God, You, Lord Jesus, are all that we need. Lord, You only truly satisfy. Lord, help us to be lifted up like Jeremiah. Help us to be lifted out of the storm like the Apostle Peter. Lord, I pray that over each and every person here this morning. Lord, if Jeremiah could find his hope back, if Jeremiah could find the happiness and the joy that it seemed like it had eluded him, Lord, so, so would it be for us as well. Lord, we can find that escape. We can have that breakthrough. And I pray it for each and every person here this morning, each and every one that's watching today. Lord, break them out of their, their pit, their sorrow, their despair. In Jesus' name, as we look to You, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Lord. God bless you guys. Thank You for the extra minutes this morning. Love y'all. I hope y'all have a great week. God bless you.